Welcome to Digital Transformation, Evolving Your Cloud Footprint. Uh, today we are joined by Paul and Chris. Paul is uh, with Slalom, and I'll give him a moment to introduce himself. And Chris is with uh, Divi Cloud. Uh, and my name is Chris Ertz. I'm also with Divi Cloud, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Um, I am a practice area director in Slalom's uh, AWS Global Growth Platform team, also known as the AWS Field Team. I provide subject matter expertise around cloud adoption uh, for all of our markets on the East Coast. Thank you, Paul. Chris. And I'm Chris Doremus, CTO and co-founder of uh, Diddy Cloud. We are based in Northern Virginia. We've been doing uh, scalable cloud compliance and automation since 2013. Wonderful. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, looking forward to hearing from both of you experts about a few things. Uh, on our agenda, we are talking about driving digital transformation, roadblocks innovation, the cloud journey, um, developing a roadmap for compliance, and enabling cloud automation. It should be a full uh, day today, but we're only going to spend probably about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, take Q&A throughout that, so if you can go to the chat box uh, through go to uh, webinar, you'll be able to enter questions throughout. We'll queue them for the end and then answer them uh, at the end, but uh, if we have any time at the end, we'll give time back to you all. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul, who's going to talk, start talking us through this. So we are here in yet another phase of the digital transformation. Um, those of us who've been in the industry for a long time remember the transition to PCs, the transition to service-oriented architecture, the transition to internet, and now we're in the transition to cloud and very excited to see what's going to happen next. It's a perpetual cycle um, where folks are looking for better and easier and more cost-effective ways to do business. These days, the driving factors for cloud are agility, being able to expand or shrink your footprint uh, to accommodate what your business needs right this minute, uh, resilience and reliability, the fact that it can somebody else make sure it's up to a 99.95 SLA or whatever your organizational requirements are, and just to stay competitive because if your competitors in your line of business are spending about 30% of what you're spending but getting the same IT services, you won't be in business for very long. So, And we've seen really on our side that this drive for innovation is coming from the board level. Is that, is that what you're seeing as well? It needs to come in both directions. Okay. So an organization won't be able to effectively transform themselves if there's no executive buy-in or the executive buy-in is only implied. Um, folks are naturally resistant to change. Um, they need some direction, they need some leadership, and that needs to come from the top. It also needs to come from the bottom. People need to have assurance that, you know, yes, we're in another change. This doesn't mean it's going to cost my job. I don't have to worry about, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So it needs to be supported from the bottom, and it needs to be led from the top. Well, I think that takes us into roadblocks. I think you've already touched on one, which is that sometimes people um, are, are roadblocks to, to this innovation. People and the, and the culture are a challenge, right? The, as AWS says that only about 10% of the addressable workloads that could be moved to cloud have been moved to cloud. Most organizations actually have kind of a preferred provider or more than one preferred provider. They have an unwritten strategy or sometimes a casually written but not, not sponsored strategy of, you know, we're going to keep stuff on premise but deploy new workloads to the cloud or we're going to move en masse and just disband our data centers and and focus on cloud solutions. But sometimes that fits in the culture, sometimes it doesn't, right? Many many organizations, they invest in their people, they believe in their people, they're gonna train their people to continue to be successful in a new you know, information technology environment. Well, Other organizations, you know, it depends on the culture. And we've seen in that cultural shift that one of the big elements is this move from command and control to sort of the, the old fashioned way of doing things and instead more of a, a trust but verify where they're really, um, you know, the, what they're looking to do is enable and amplify by these digitally savvy business units that are starting to spring up. How have you seen that manifest itself? So that we're, we're getting away from the culture of no, yeah. yes. where whatever you wanted to do, <laughs> the security officer said no, right? We have, the cloud makes so many wonderful things possible, so much innovation possible, but the organization has to evolve. It has to understand that, uh, anything that's friction is going to reduce competitiveness it's going to increase cost and there are other more modern more you know the new companies which are born cloud native which can run circles around the traditional 14 levels of management that it requires to get approval to launch a virtual yeah. machine yeah. right so part of the change is helping organizations understand you know it's not evil and there are controls that are already in place and there are tools that can extend those controls so that they don't have to micromanage everything. They can have blanket policies in place and let those policies control the infrastructure and the activities that people engage in without worrying about everything going off the rails. And it so sets up guardrails for an organization so that you know leadership has confidence that things are still under control without having to check on them every minute. Yeah, absolutely. So it does sound like you know, in, in 
all you, know, you have to you have to overcome that cultural blockage, but then also it sounds like you have to sort of reinvent the frameworks and the systems that you know you can't just take what you're doing in the data center and think it's going to work you know for a framework and a systems perspective. Is that accurate? That that's absolutely true. Um, many Okay, the concepts are the same. Virtualization, storage, and networking is the same concept, whether it's in your data center or whether it's in AWS's cloud, but the capabilities that modern cloud service providers give you go far beyond that they had in the data center. Tools for the monitoring and management, not just of the health, but of the compliance and every level of activity of what's going on within the ecosystem that you have there. So, so most, many organizations, especially large enterprises, have a robust governance plan which defines their security and their compliance and how they deal with audits and who, you, who can buy servers or not buy servers. They typically focus on who can actually go to the Dell website, log on and buy a server, right? Yeah. Now you need to have a policy which says who can go to the Amazon console yeah. and launch a server instead, right? It's pennies versus thousands of dollars, yeah. but if you leave the pennies running in the wrong yeah. context, it can cost you thousands of dollars. So, so talk to us, because you've talked about, I think, the, the, the beginning of the cloud journey. Um, and let's talk through that. Where does it begin? And sort of, you know, I guess never ends. No, it never. But 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 you know, at least where where does it directionally go to? And and how do the companies evolve? At least, and I think on a couple of different layers, maybe. So we we found it beneficial to kind of look at folks in one of four different buckets: um, cloud curious, cloud ready, cloud first, or cloud native. And cloud curious is where a lot of folks are. Those folks who who have 10% of their workloads actually running in a cloud service provider. They see the potential. They have haven't been able to address the organizational changes yet. Maybe they're waiting for their data center lease to run out. They, they're just, they're not sure, right? We're, we're curious, it could work for us. There's so much stuff we don't know, right? We don't know how we're going to, to modernize our business processes. We don't know how we're going to train our people. They might start out with uh, launching a free trial account and doing a proof of concept out there. Hopefully they're not putting any enterprise data out there while they're, yeah. while they're in the process of doing it. But sooner or later from the bottom, typically this grows a little bit, right? It gets attention and, and people begin to realize that we need to have a little structure around this. We can't have people expensing activities and using company data and things that we don't control. We don't want to control them, but we do need to make sure that we're secure. And so they start to deploy landing zones or areas which comply with the organization's security policies and are compatible with, you know, IP addressing schemes so you can at least connect to it at some point. They run virtual machines which may run new workloads or just be file servers. They're they're learning, right? How are we actually going to, to be successful with this? And most of them are thinking about how am I going to get my stuff out of my expensive data center or data centers and into the cloud? Then you get cloud first, and cloud first and cloud ready can be combined. A lot of organizations say, we have three more years on this contract, It's going to, we have termination clauses which are really expensive, we're not putting anything else in the data center, anything that we do new, new though is going to go into the cloud. That's so exactly. we're going to use infrastructure as a service in the cloud, or services that are only offered in the cloud, or managed services in the cloud. And then cloud native, you know, we don't do as much work in this type of governance with organizations that are born in the cloud, the next Netflixes and Instagrams yeah. and all of those folks, they never had a physical presence, right? Their, their governance was defined by their initial infrastructure, which was actually a cloud native solution. And Chris, you know, I heard there, uh, Paul mentioned the landing zone, and that's something that I've seen come up quite a bit at Divi Cloud with our customers. You know, one of the, I think the things we've seen is that a lot of people in the early days of their cloud journey think about security compliance, governance as sort of a one-time event or a periodic event. But we've seen that that's very dangerous if you're not thinking about it continuously. When is the time that you think about landing zones? You know, when is the right time and, and how do you think about it from an automation continuous process perspective? I mean, day one and, and, and really every day. I mean, cloud, cloud compliance has to be a continual um, thing that you throw resources at. You have to throw people at it, you have to throw tooling at it. Um, the rate of change you see in in the cloud compared to the data center days is, is exponentially higher. Um, you know, maybe in data center times you'd see a couple hundred changes a month. And when you go to the cloud, we work with a multi you know national enterprise customer today who sees about seven million changes a month, and that that rate of change can manifest to dozens, hundreds, or thousands of compliance infractions. So you want to be thinking about this every single day throughout your your cloud journey. Yeah, so, so Paul, back to you. I think there's sort of two layers to this cloud journey. We've talked to, on technology, but I think there's the organization layer as well. Yeah, if you, if you look at that last slide, you'll see a lot of references to technology components, right? Yep. Infrastructure as a service and containers and microservices. That's the technology perspective. Yep. There's a huge business perspective for most organizations, yep. right? It's easy to launch a server, but how do you manage the people that are launching the servers? And so cloud curious organizations, they're the, you know, we're a 250 year old organization and the CIO reports to the CFO and we have a structure underneath where we have people who do databases and we have people 
people who do storage and never the twain shall meet, which gets really confusing in the modern world, right? Where you have database services that talk to storage services and yeah, yeah. Nobody, will, nobody wants to take responsibility for it. And so it kind of floats around the organization until somebody says, hey, I'll take that and actually is able to make a name for themselves. It, it, Cloud Curious is where you need to recognize the current state and understand that things need to change to be successful in the next state. So as, as organizations move to cloud ready, this is typically where they define their cloud operating model. Are we gonna be all in? Are we gonna stay on premise? Are we gonna have a hybrid architecture? And who's gonna help us figure this out? And the folks who help figure that out within an organization are typically grouped together in what's called a cloud center of excellence. And so the CCOE in, in most organizations is folks from the IT shop, but connected to other parts of the organization connected to what used to be the database guys, connected to what used to be the storage guys, connected to corporate uh, executive leadership for governance policies and compliance, connected to business units to help deliver IT services to them out of service catalogs, for example, right? Where instead of somebody in the IT department having to manually deploy the infrastructure, you can click in a service catalog and say, I need 10 servers for 30 days to do this particular proof of concept. And much of that happens automatically. Cloud first is where your organizational IT is beginning to align with the services delivery model of cloud service providers and managed service providers and ISPs, which makes everything just operate so much more smoothly, right? Someone in your organization interfaces with something in the cloud environment in a way that the responsibilities are clear and the responsiveness is high. Then cloud native, uh, you know, automation is, is a key component of cloud native solutions. Very few people actually touch the console ever. I mean, mm -hmm. why would you touch the console? That's yeah. a risk point. And also it's really tedious for administration. <laughs> Your infrastructure is defined by, you know, cloud formation scripts yeah. or by JSON or in yeah. automation tools. Yeah. And you and that's the way that you evolve it as you go forward. We have infrastructure version 2019.1. We change something based on availability, based on cost, based on performance. We get, you know, our corporate infrastructure version 2019.2. I want to touch on something because I, this comes up quite a bit when I'm talking to, to uh, IT leaders. The cloud center of excellence, what happens to it, right? So it, you, you may formulate it in the cloud ready stage. Is it then later collapsing back into the rest of the IT organization? Walk us through what you're seeing in the market. So typically uh, people regard it as a transition activity. It's not really so much a transi transition activity in most places. Yes, it's founded to help evolve our governance from an on-premise solution to a cloud-ready solution. It's founded to have a decision framework on how we're going to move our workloads. Are we gonna retire, retain, rehost, request? or repurchase or re-architect, you know, in the AWS nomenclature. How are we going to train our people to support this? How are we going to work with the business units? But the migration and adoption may be a one-time activity, but the innovation related to services only available in the cloud is not. Yeah. And so, you know, coming up December 2nd, reinvent Las Vegas, Nevada, 80,000 of Andy Chassis' close friends and hundreds and hundreds of new services. I'm glad that I'm one of his closest friends because I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> As a, and, and so all of those new services, right? Alexa, voice services, artificial intelligence services, machine language, machine learning services. How, do, how are those adopted in organizations? And given that they're typically cloud specific, most cloud center of excellence in, instances in enterprises, part of their charter is evaluate new technologies mm -hmm. provided by cloud service providers or across the IT or technology domain and figure out, is this beneficial to my enterprise? Is it compatible with what we're doing? How am I going to introduce it and have a structured methodology for introducing innovative solutions into the enterprise? Yeah, that's great to hear that there's a steady state there that they can evolve to. I think uh, from what I've seen, Slalom has a great framework that can help customers really navigate their cloud journey. Can you walk us through that? Because I think everyone would love to hear it. Uh, we do have a framework. Um, sure. Slalom in uh, in its uh, early days was a business advisory services organization and we still have outstanding business advisory services capabilities. We now across our markets have practices around data and analytics, around information management, around customer experience. We build mobile and web-based solutions for customers in our build network. We have, It's not just a technology problem. And so Slalom has capabilities around business alignment, organizational change management, communications, delivery leadership, establishing key performance indicators, right? How do you know if your enterprise is actually succeeding in their effort to transform and use cloud? Mm -hmm. You have to figure out, are we headed in the right direction and how do we measure it and how do we evolve it? Operations and governance, uh, business processes evolve and governance is required in the modern world. GDPR and you know the PCI and pick a pick a regulatory framework. Every organization which touches almost any piece of data actually has an extensive library of, of um, security constraints and requirements that they're subject to, and they get audited, right? So you can't think about this after the fact when the auditor mm -hmm. comes and says, "Oh, it's a December 31st time for yeah. 
PCI audit, yeah. you need to be prepared and you need to have a plan as part of your governance to, to adapt to that. Um, skills change, right? I, information uh, management, whether it's storage and virtualization and networking, if you can run VMware, you can run AWS, yeah. but how are you going to teach people to be successful with machine learning? What are they going to do with SageMaker? How are you going to evolve your data strategy to take advantage of data warehouses and data lakes in a way that provides value to your business. And, and I think you've mentioned before, I've heard you talk about it, that it's it's less expensive and quicker to you know, adopt, sort of get your current people, your current talent to be able to take those, those new capabilities on. HR will always tell you it costs yeah. much more to hire a person than it does to keep a person. Yeah. And in areas where we're doing business now, unemployment in the tech sector is running something less than 2%. And that's that's below it's good natural. Us, right? It's good news for us. It's below the level the level of natural unemployment, right? We can't find folks to actually deliver work that we could sell. Yeah. And so, why would you let go of a super valuable resource when you can send them to learning? You can enroll them in online learning. You can let them figure out how to be successful in in new technologies and to move the business forward. So, we do a lot of talent gap analysis and training recommendations for organizations that value their employees and want to keep them. And then security and compliance, uh, an idea so nice, we mentioned it twice. We, you know, it's it's from the bottom to the top. It's a partnership with AWS. You can't bolt it on after the fact. You have to be intentional yeah. about how you're going to comply with privacy regulations, how you're going to protect employee and customer data. And Chris, you know, um, talk to us a little bit because you know, one of the big changes that I think happens when people come to the cloud is is to understand a the shared responsibility model, right? That Amazon is is securing their side or Microsoft securing their side of the equation. Um, but then there's a lot of flexibility on the customer side and a lot of, of room for error there. Um, and can you talk about what you're seeing, you know, sort of tying together operations and governance, security compliance, and maybe, you know, maybe take an example of how center of cloud excellences are, are, are sort of addressing this, um, you know, from their perspective. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, look, from a security compliance perspective with that shared responsibility model, um, you really first need to think about tooling. I mean, it, whether you're a small company or an enterprise company, you're going to have more cloud sprawl than you realize going in. And if you don't have tooling to keep that under control and get visibility on it, your half of the share responsibility model is going to be very, very hard to keep keep yeah. pace with. Um, so, you know, whether it's open source tooling, whether it's tooling, you know, so there's a lot of commercial products out there to kind of focus on that. Find ones that focus on security compliance and also automation. We'll touch more on that a little bit, you know, a little bit later. And maybe tell us a quick story. I, I think you mentioned to me there was a global financial services organization you've worked, that we've worked with mm -hmm. recently that that has a cloud of excellence. And can you talk through sort of how they address security compliance and operations and governance for that global business? Yeah, and so I mean, look, they have multiple lines of business. They meet um, every single month and they they go over how they're doing across each line of business across each of these different cloud services. Uh, you know, they kind of break it up into you know analytics services, storage services, networking services, and they look across all their different views uh, at, at how they're doing. It becomes a little bit of a name and shame game, but for the ones that aren't doing as well, that's opportunities to better educate, to better inform them on how to do cloud correctly. It's interesting too what, what, what Paul said, you know, we, we see that in this particular customer is one of them at the reinvents of the world when these new services are, are unveiled, that is when their biggest compliance infractions do manifest because no one knows how to use these services and how to configure them appropriately. One thing that you can certainly work on doing is work with your account provider, you know, or your account manager at the cloud service provider to get early access and to get preview access to some of these upcoming services so you know about them before your developers do. And you can get an idea on how you want to secure them and how you want to work work with them. And I think you've mentioned also that there is a, a governing body that's within that cloud service excellence that really addresses what Paul talked about, which is this you have all these new services you just mentioned as well. How do they how do they think about those new services from this governing body? Yeah, so I mean, first we certainly see people having a whitelist or a blacklist approach. So you know, whitelist out of 150 Amazon services that they have today, soon to be 200 after you know December's announcements, um, they go in and they they actually use things like service control policies to actually turn off these new features and capabilities. Um, you know, when when you think about compliance, it's, it's really a three pronged approach, right? You've got reactive compliance, which you're reacting to change, and you want to do it as quickly as possible. You're using things like CloudWatch events and CloudTrail to detect anomalous behavior and then react to it. You want to really take advantage of the preventative features that you've seen Amazon and other CSPs bring to market, which help you put policies in place to prevent the bad. You know, you don't want to let people turn off CloudTrail. Why? Why would you? You don't want to allow them to turn off AWS config rules. These are things that protect you. So take advantage of those cloud native services, which many times are free to help you do cloud more securely. And then you really want to shift left into the build pipeline. We'll talk about that more, but you know, really it becomes when you're, you know, Paul mentioned before, you're using Terraform, you're using CloudFormation, you're, you're really exposing infrastructure more as code 
and you're treating it almost in your source you know, control management policies with standard pull request reviews. You want to you get on top of this before it gets deployed, before it manifests, because even if something is out there in an insecure state for five minutes, that's five minutes that you could be you know, com uh, you know, compromised, your data could be available to a malicious actor, many of which I might say are less sophisticated than they were back in the 90s. You don't have to be as sophisticated of a malicious actor to be able to read a public bucket or get access to a public Elasticsearch. So we went deep on the technology. Let me pull it back for a moment and get beyond the technology um, and talk about uh, the key organizational aspects. Paul, can you walk us through some of the high level non-technology things that people should be thinking about as they go through this cloud journey? Yeah, this this kind of brings us full circle. Right? Yeah. The, the first question top center is know the why. Yeah. Why are you interested in cloud? Are you attracted to bright shiny objects or are you feel, <laughs> feeling competitive pressure or it offers a unique and distinguishing capability that you can't replicate on premise, right? Yeah. The, there are a number of reasons that organizations move to the cloud or not move to the cloud depending on, on what it is that they need intrinsically. Once you know the why, executive alignment is key. We talked about top to bottom and bottom to top, right? The organization has to agree and it has to be assertive that that's the direction they're going to go. Um, natural human tendencies, even with the best change management, our status quo is better than unknown and, and so you need to proactively manage that in the process. You need to have an operating model of, of what your organization is going to do in this new hybrid architecture. Support your people and help them get new skills and behaviors. And that cloud center of excellence, I mean, it, it's it's a key component for large enterprises to be successful at this. Someone has to have the responsibility, someone has to lead, someone has to, to uh, evangelize, and someone has to enable. But enabling with IT is a lot like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything <laughs> about it, right? This is an opportunity to have an a component in the organization which actually does enable, right? Mm -hmm. When the when new services are announced at reInvent, either they proactively participated in evaluating the services, they have test beds, or they have, it's easy in cloud, right? You can partition off a section, a separate account that's affiliated with your organization. Let people play where they have no access to corporate data. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what boundaries they're going to push with it, right? Give them test data and see what's the minimum set of permissions when we move this to production that we need to put in place to manage it and keep it secure. And, and Chris, I think we've seen on that new skills and behaviors, that's true of the security organization too, that you know, uh, in many cases, yeah, these are, again, board level initiatives that are saying, go big and go fast, give developers access, let them experiment and innovate. And then to the security team, don't, don't, don't slow them down, right? Which puts people in a hard spot. Um, and you know, how does security change from being sort of the four letter word that's the, the culture of no to something a little more? Have you seen that? And, and sort of what are some of the things that, that enable security to really adopt uh, and, and change the, you know, gain those new skills and behaviors? Certainly, I mean, I think one of the first things we've seen, and we've had several enterprise customers do it, uh, we have a you know, multi-national you know, retail um, apparel brand that does this, where they have ephemeral accounts across all the cloud service providers where people can go in and play with Google's latest big data machine learning service. So they can go into Amazon and Tinker, um, but they effectively have automation that turns this stuff off or destroys it after seven days, 14 days, whatever they kind of define the, the, the threshold is. Now you've allowed people, you've given them the freedom to innovate, the freedom to explore, get these new services, see how their workloads will run, but it's done in a secure environment to kind of echo what, what Paul just said. These are sandbox environments with no sensitive data. There's no connection peering to production workloads, so you can feel safe and secure that even if they make a mistake, they're not exposing their company's you know, secrets and you know, sensitive workloads. Yeah, so it's great. So security really becomes this enabler and amplifier again of these digital savvy business units. They're 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 not just blockers. Yep. It's wonderful. So so talk us through. I think you know on the you know Paul, I, I think there's some key capabilities that are required to acquire, plan, build, operate, and manage cloud service management. It's a mouthful, just to say, but you know you got to do it too. <laughs> um, what does that mean? In, in like what are the ways? How do you break it down so people can actually think about this in, in a way? So, so in practical terms, it's yeah. kind of like this building block model that we have here. Yeah. Uh, whether you realign your organization structurally to match this, or yeah. whether you use this as a guiding principle from your yeah. from your IT organization, it doesn't matter. The, at the bottom, you have infrastructure, right? Things as simple as virtualization storage and networking to manage services to leading edge tools like Lex and Poly and, and integration of voice technology into your into your business. And above that, that undifferentiated infrastructure comes all of your actual product, right? You have product management, which is what are we going to build or what are we going to deliver and how is software engineering going to do it and manage it? Are we going to use DevOps, DevOps on-premise, DevOps in the cloud, a custom tool chain? Are we going to use AWS's tool chains? 
on through who's going to operate that and mm -hmm. operations is are we going to operate it or are we going to have a managed service provider actually handle patch tuesday and smoke test our machines and if things hang are they just going to nuke them and launch a new golden image so that we don't debug anymore right I, organizations are still in the debugging mindset they need to evolve forwards and then the financial governance part all of this is meant to make an organization's financial health more competitive regardless of the industry that it's in and then at the top you have transformation management and cloud enablement that's the leadership right leadership in the organization commitment to a particular path commitment to doing it in a way that's secure a way that provides value to the business a way that enables people and a way that's cost effective i think you touched on this before but that cloud enablement sounds like a lot of people change management it, it, it change never underestimate the amount of change management required never under communicate with an organization that undergoing an IT transformation yeah. you know people people feel that IT is doing things to them not with them <laughs> and and there are there are very refined practices around how do you actually get people engaged yeah. there are tools and mechanisms to get people to buy in and support as opposed to going home at the end of the day and saying I'm worried that this cloud transformation means the end of my job and, and secretly sandbagging it as an activity yeah. and and Chris touch on you know, Paul mentioned financial governance I know this is an area where you spent a lot of time uh, you know helping uh, customers, can you walk us through uh, a few thoughts on that topic? Sure, absolutely. I mean, look, you 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 want to baseline what people can and can't do, and you think about, you know, you get access to the Amazon console, you're you're kind of walking in with a blank check. You can click a lot of buttons. You can get 16 core systems, 64 core systems. We see multiple enterprise customers have a employee who mistakenly clicks the largest instance type, something that doesn't cost pennies an hour, like Paul said. It costs dollars per hour, sometimes 35, 40 dollars an hour. Uh, if that this adds up quickly. This adds up quickly. You know, we, 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 Especially if you're not watching. <laughs> and, and, and typically folks are not watching. They don't have yeah. budget alerting and things of that nature. So you know, this now is not a capital expenditure. It's an operational expenditure. You have to keep tabs month to month, sometimes week to week. And uh, we've seen bills with $40,000, $80,000 spikes in it that were un, unaccounted for. People didn't put it in their budget and it torpedoes what they kind of thought that they have for the year. So you know, really set some some automation policies and controls around what people can deploy into various accounts. Um, and I also really liked what, what Paul touched on the operation side of things. I think that that's a very important call mm -hmm. out here. You, you, you know, Operationally, you don't treat your servers the same way you used to back in data center days. If there's a problem with them, oftentimes we see enterprise customers not logging in via SSH or RDP to fix the problem. They just blow away the server and deploy a new one. Yeah. Um, and so when you think about patch management and you know updating you know your your underlying images, whether it's Windows or Linux, just rehydrate, just get a new image and redeploy your workloads. Now this is oftentimes only possible when you're more mature, yep. when you're now cloud cloud first and cloud native. But this is what the more advanced consumers of cloud are doing, and it reduces the operational overhead at scale. And it, you really want to start thinking about that early. So I think you just started to drift into you know, thoughts around compliance, and just like we talked about sort of the building blocks, can you talk us through? Yeah, for the po folks who may be on the phone who are just starting, how do you actually get there? How do you go from you know, today, where you may be immature or frankly just getting started, to sort of a more mature, you know, mature framework for this? Can you walk us through sort of maybe the core areas? Absolutely. I mean, there are there is a lot of great uh, compliance frameworks out there. Um, you know, CIS comes to mind. They have the uh, Center for Internet Security has their uh, benchmarks across Amazon, Google, Azure, even Kubernetes. These OpenStack, Amazon Linux, they have dozens of these. They really give you kind of almost best in class recommendations for the core services you see in these clouds. They're not going to touch on the SageMakers and the Kinesis services, but you know, EC2, S3, That's where you, go to solve for help. you can go to solve for help there, absolutely. <laughs> um, but you know, these are things that if you don't know how to use the core services right, day one, you're doomed when you get into more advanced yeah. services, right? So start there. And these, these frameworks are great because not only do they tell you what to look for, they tell you how to fix it. Um, now, it's it, it, the instructions it gives you are very manual, but when you want to move towards automation, they've effectively laid out the breadcrumbs for you. Um, you know, once you're done with CS, you know, benchmarks, you can look at bodies like, like uh, you know, the CSA CCM, the Cloud Control Matrix, which has, you know, 200 industry experts who meet a couple times a year, and they do the heavy lifting to give you almost cloud mapping of what these controls are to legacy frameworks that predate cloud, you know, PCI, some of the NIST frameworks. So they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you to make that transition from legacy data center into a cloud. You know, and then, you know, as you think about, as you mature, look, the shared responsibility model, the only way you can do it at scale is with tooling, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, there's open source tools, the clouds have some tools, but what, regardless if you're looking for commercial products or open source, embrace tooling, you know, embrace automation, embrace these things that will monitor for this for you. 
and kind of improve the signal to noise ratio effectively. Um, and, you know, really culturally, again, going back to what you said earlier, Chris, command and control just cannot work at scale today. You've got to do trust, but verify, embrace it, um, educate employees. There's a real gap, you know, in, in the market today on cloud knowledge. We're giving more and more people access to the cloud and not teaching them how to do it the right way. So, you know, work with your employees, train them up to Paul's point. It's a lot better to train the people you do have than to go look for those you know, industry experts out there. Um, and again, not to be a dead horse, but as you mature, you've got to move from manual intervention to automation. You know, start small, start in those kind of isolated workloads where the blast rate is smaller. Once you feel comfortable with those automations, start to scale them out across the enterprise. So I, I do want to be, be, beat that dead horse. So let's. So you, you've talked about automation a lot, but how do you actually do it? What are sort of the core principles? Absolutely. Um, I think it's, it starts really with establishing policy. You, you know, use those compliance frameworks that I mentioned before as kind of a starting point. But really, if you think about policy, you have to have the ability to scope and have different workflows for different parts of your cloud. Um, you might want to take a different automation workflow for production workloads, which are more sensitive, than development and sandbox workloads. Um, so being able to define the steps differently um, is you know, paramount. I also think you really need to think about tagging. Uh, tagging is, is so effective, and I think Paul's probably seen this himself, that you know, Amazon in the clouds went from having a maximum of 10 tags per resource to now 50, and you're seeing folks like Amazon and Azure commit to having tagging across every resource type that they support over the next 24 months. And I think GCP uh, He's doing their next-gen labeling as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, tagging is great for having a point of contact for who do I reach out to. You know, you have to have attribution on who provisioned this resource incorrectly so you can educate them. But it's also good, and I'm curious to Paul's perspective is on this, it's also good from a kind of compl a compliance and data sensitivity perspective yeah. where you can automate differently based on that. Oh, what do you see? Oh, it's it's an always evolving thing. I, I, back when I worked for AWS, tagging was opt-in. Right? <laughs> you could launch an EC2 instance and then you trusted people to actually go in and add the metadata. Yeah. There was no way to enforce it, yeah. right? And it, that has, thankfully those days are far behind us yeah. now. So organizations invest a lot in their tagging taxonomy. I mean, they're cost components, security components, risk components is beyond the user name and email address of the person who launched it, right? Yeah. It, there's a lot more data in there. And from a security perspective, you, there's no reason, and many organizations do, tag their, you know, low risk data, medium risk data, high risk data, and use that to determine where they need to focus their security efforts and where they need to, to implement closer monitoring on their policies. And I, I'm assuming that also, I think you've told the story in the past, and I heard it was, um, you know, when you do have something like that, that low risk tagging or the high risk, then when a new policy comes around, you know, I think that benefits it, correct? Absolutely, because you can immediately identify what's in scope and what's out of scope yeah. for the new policy, yeah. right? And so it, it, it avoids that issue of, oh, we updated all the firewall rules, we updated all the user policies on these 996 instances, we forgot that one. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, going back, I, I think the next step is really around CI/CD tooling. Yep. So, I mean, Paul really, really touched on it there. You've got Terraform, you've got you know CloudFormation, you've got Azure Arm templates. All of these ways to deploy faster and more predictable and more repeatable out out in the cloud. And you know, we start thinking about how folks are doing it. They're not going into the Amazon console to, to deploy these workloads. They're doing it via the CI/CD pipeline processes. And you want to really start to inspect those templates, almost treat them like like source code. It should be pull mm -hmm. Quest reviews, you should look at changes and make sure that you're tagging and labeling at that layer properly, because if you're not, the problem is just going to continually manifest as they redeploy and update the state. Yeah. And your auditors will love it. I mean, when you, <laughs> when you use all the cloud service yeah. provider capabilities yeah. and then you add Divi Cloud on yeah. top of it, yeah. instead of having to walk step by step through a playbook or a run yeah. book or a compliance book, yeah. you can say, here's my infrastructure as defined yeah. and here was my change management process. Yes. And you're sure that it's yes. compliant. It yeah. saves so much time. Yeah, and really then it's all about the monitoring and enforcement of that. And, you know, again, going back to the tooling, you have to have systems in place to monitor the effectiveness of your automations. Going back to the, you know, Cloud Center of Excellence, generally when that starts, you see a lot of red and orange. You have a lot of security infractions out there. You go back to the CCOA meetings and you're able to, to look right back to automation as, as, as a way to drive that down to green across the board. Well, this has been wonderful. I want to thank both Paul and Chris for sharing your, your wisdom. We're going to shift now to Q&A and cover the questions that have been asked and give you a chance to ask some more questions. Thanks, Chris.